I invited a couple of people. I don't know how many will show. Oh, there's my brother, Doug. Yeah. That he doesn't have his picture figured out. Way to <laughs> way to pack the room, right? <laughs> they must have heard it was me. Oh, there's my brother. <laughs> hey. <laughs> That's very good. He's in California. Oh, cool. Hi, Doug. I'm Josh. Hi, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm the ringleader of this menagerie of misfits. So. <laughs> I think that should be our new tagline, menagerie of misfits. I like that. <laughs> misfits at F8. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd love to do an F8 challenge. I think that should be the photo composition competition. Best shots at F8. Uh, when, when I taught digital photography introduction, I, I I offered an A to anybody in the class who could tell me what an F stop was. Mm. I never found one. Bonus points if you can tell me what a T stop is. <laughs> yeah. Does, it, does anybody know what a T stop is? Yeah, transmission. Yeah, it's what's used in film. So the same lens that you might have in the in a photographic world, uh, the aperture that's listed is theoretical. Uh, F stop is theoretical, whereas T stop is the actual transmission of the light. So the same lens, if it's in a cinema lens, you'll see that it has a different aperture list, and that's because they're listing the T stop, which is the actual light transmission, not the theoretical. It's also why all your two eight lenses don't like. Sometimes they don't give you the same exposure when you switch, um, or an F four lens doesn't give you the same exposure when you switch because they have different T stops. A T stop is like an F stop, but more cinematic. <laughs> Yeah, a, a T-stop went to film school, so it's like an F-stop, but with more student debt. <laughs> <laughs> and if I understand you right, more accurate. T is more accurate. Yeah. Yeah, T, T is the actual light transmission. F is just the theoretical lens to opening, lens size and opening ratio. And how come we don't use T-stop? Uh, we should. We should. So actually, you'll notice that like some of the some of the same like Rokinon lenses. If you buy them in the in the photo version, they'll be two eight, and then you'll buy them in the uh, T in the cinema version, they'll be like three five. Yeah, it's it's a it's like a two thirds difference. Whereas some of the like like first party manufacturers, you're getting you're getting a more a, a closer uh, yeah maybe like two point nine or three instead of two eight. So you're getting you're getting a lot more transmission out of some of the first party than some of the cheaper lenses. It sounds like a T stop should be British. Yeah, yeah. I I'm not British, but I often stop for T stops. <laughs> uh, that's good. That's good. How's everybody doing? Anybody getting out and shooting? Yesterday, yay! Yay! Awesome. I shot forty five hundred photos of a corporate event the last three days. Very exciting. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But, but I shot all in JPEG and then just delivered them straight. No editing. Well, we shot. Thank God. <laughs> no, I know that's the way to do it. That's the only reason I take that job is like when I'm done, I walk out, they're all uploaded. I'm out. So yeah, we're delivering them like every 45 minutes. So it's kind of a data management fun process. That's good. This is my friend, Steve Thomas, Steve Thomas here. Hi, Steve. Joined your group. So, hello. He's a avid amateur. That's that's what most of this group is. That's well, what he's gotten back into film, so I'm not so sure how smart. He is. <laughs> you weren't spending enough money on photography, so you jumped to film. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> If you really, if you really want to make your photo habit expensive, take it underwater. Ooh, yeah, that's a that's a good way to like uh, add add a ten x cost to everything you do. <laughs> yeah, and your travel suitcases. <laughs> yeah, your Pelican cases, your housings. It's real fun. <laughs> real fun. It's fun. Okay. It's awesome. yeah. Hey, Lazo, what's up? Uh, I just photographed my backyard. Uh, my fall in logs and then uh, shoot 10 raw and uh, shoot four by fives. And then I developed those in a dark room. This came out in FP4 film. These came out outstanding, beautiful. Those are my website blogs. Awesome. So, 
Very cool. Is anybody else here Jawas on the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there, there's some digital mice running around, it sounds like. Yep. Uh, little chipmunks. Yeah. It's not my six-year-old this time. He's got headphones on. Yeah. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Um, my name's Josh Baker. I, Like I said, I lead this... Uh, misfit band of uh photographers um welcome to our third thursday meetings um this is north austin photographic society pf because we're i'm in pflugerville what's up pf where everything has to have a pf or it's not allowed um yeah it, there's a tax if you don't uh, use pf so um so yeah anybody have uh anything going on anything we ought to know about what's up bill i see you. you're Howdy. on here, but how you doing man I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, good to see you. Your beard is getting to epic links. <laughs> oh, it could go wild. <laughs> one, one more, one more month, and they're going to start casting you in the Lord of the Rings. Hey, this has been trimmed uh, <laughs> once through all of this. Yeah, I I had it going, and it it got too hot, and it, I had to take it out. It was it was too much. It was too much. So, very good. Anybody else have anything going on we ought to know about before we let Les start talking? going once going twice all right well welcome Les. thanks for uh for joining us sure. um last year we would be doing this in person and we couldn't have your brother in from california so this is exciting um yay technology and always thanks for ed for setting all this stuff up proving once again that he's better than me um <laughs> um so yeah uh Les, I'll, I'll hand it over to you i'll shut up and listen um, I want to put the, how do I put my pictures up now? I do the, do I hit the share? Yeah, yeah, hit the share button and that, you'll be able to screen share from there. Okay. And. Okay, let me go to slide view. Okay, is there some way I can get some of this? I can push it over to the side, I guess, a little. Okay. All right, I don't, I don't. We, we see your whole screen, so. Okay, okay, good, yeah, good. It's good. Um, I put several pictures up here in, in a lot of different frames just to show them, but um, <clears throat> um, I was very fortunate in my, in my late youth in that my father, my school teacher father took a job with the Air Force when I was 16 and we moved to Spain and uh, to Seville, Spain, where there was a, a US Air Force base. And my father was going to be a teacher in the in the dependent school, which I attended. Fortunately, he was a grade school teacher and I was in high school, so I didn't have to have him for a teacher. But um, so uh, that was the beginning of my interest in photography was I thought, well, I better take pictures. So I started taking pictures there and got very uh, interested in um, the uh, in the world of photography, some of these were taken during in in Seville, Spain. They have a big fair every year called the April Fair. It's been going on for over a hundred years, and as, as a matter of fact, this year because of the pandemic is the first year that that they didn't have it. So, but a lot of beautiful outfits and things like that. So it was really wonderful to see, and loved loved Spain. But um, then I. Uh, uh, joined the Navy <laughs> to see the world and um, I wanted to be a photographer, but I, I took all the intelligence tests and I was way too smart to be a photographer. <laughs> and uh, I spent a year in electronic school and then um, I was, I got fortunate again and I was stationed in Japan in a spy squadron. And it was pretty cool because you can see my picture down in the corner there. And I, I wasn't a pilot, but I was an I was an ECM operator. I I was the guy that the squadron existed for. And I sat in front of a scope and watched uh, scary things on it and stuff like that. We mainly flew the coast of Russia, but then we ended up in a little thing called Vietnam, where uh, um, ended up uh, flying over Vietnam, locating mobile SAM sites. So that wasn't my favorite. This is just mute there. Okay, um, Doug, you need to shut off your mic over there. I can hear you. Hi. 
Okay. Um, I love Japan, though. I was stationed there for two years, and again, the land of the big Nikon, so I got into Nikons there and stuff like that, and, and had a, a lovely time. And uh, this is Kyoto, the old capital, um, and I love the, the geishas, and I was fortunate. I've been to Kyoto three times, and each time I was able to photograph a geisha, so that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> after leaving the Navy, I started studying photography, and um, I went to a junior college first, and um, then I heard about this place called the Art Center College of Design. I don't know if you have, any of you have ever heard of it, but of its type, it's the most famous school in the world. And um, it teaches 11 majors, one of them being photography, but the one it's really famous for is automobile design. And of course, I didn't study that, but it was really cool to go around and see people designing actual cars. It is the leading automobile design school in the world. And anyway, I got a BFA in photography from there. And then the next smart move I made was move to New York from Los Angeles. So um, I landed in New York with, with hardly a dime and thinking it was as cheap as, as uh, Southern California, which it wasn't. <laughs> Probably starved for a while. But through some connections, I was able to get a job assisting this man. And then, this is Arnold Newman. And I won't talk about him much, but I, they put up a, a video I did on him on your website. And if you haven't seen it, take a look at it. This man is probably the greatest portrait photographer who ever lived. And incredible, incredible guy. So it was really interesting. And I helped print his first major book called One Mind's Eye. By the way, his collection is at the Ransom Center at UT. If you've never been to the Ransom Center, you ought to go. But it's pretty cool. They have a lot of they have a very good photo collection there, and they even have the very first photo that they've ever done in its own little building. So, pretty cool. Anyway, uh, I started doing different things after I left him, and I even uh, I started. Do, I like I always liked portraiture, and these are a couple of my early things in New York. And uh, the man on the left is uh, a costume designer, Randy Barcello. He did the costumes for Jesus Christ Superstar. The man on the on the right is David George Weiss, and he wrote such songs as It's a Wonderful World and The Lion Sleeps Tonight. So interesting personalities. I even did a little bit of fashion just because that's what um, it seemed like the big portrait guys like Newman and I'm not Newman so much. Newman didn't do fashion, but Avedon and Penn did. So I did a little bit of it. And uh, it's a, a good way to waste a lot of money shooting models portfolios, but uh, anyway. It's kind of interesting. Anyway, I got into doing um, a lot of corporate work, and I, I shot for uh, uh, Fortune, Forbes, and Business Week on a regular basis, and you know whatever they needed, especially like Business Week. Boy, if you weren't there to answer your phone, they went on to the next photographer after two rings. So it made you nervous to leave anywhere because this was before the day of even pagers. They wouldn't even page you, so it was <laughs> made for an exciting time but uh, different portraits here. Then I moved in 1979, after almost uh, nine years in New York, I moved to Dallas because I had a good friend from school who was doing quite well there. And this was one of my first assignments in um, Dallas. And this is Stanley Marcus. And most of you have probably heard of Neiman Marcus. Well, he's the Marcus in, in Neiman Marcus, and it was his father that, and, and, uh, the Neiman that founded it, and he was a big deal in Dallas. He was quite a quite a fellow, and I always enjoyed this picture because most of his pictures he looks very somber, but he was very a very cheerful guy. So he's he's eighty five in this picture. So he he hung in there for a long time. Somebody said when he died at ninety six. Somebody said Stanley showed us how to die die young at ninety six. So interesting. A lot of portraiture. I, lo I love the portraiture, and these are for different things. And sometimes you can do something simple. This this guy on the left was he was doing a uh, an MBA on the NBA, and that was shot for uh, Baylor University. And so uh, again, they don't tell me what to do. They say do a good picture. So I found a place to take him. This was the practice rink for the Mavericks, and I used a few gels in there to make it look more interesting, and had him hold the balls. The guy on the on the left was an engineer, and uh, they wanted to show that he was an engineer. I just had him hold up one of those 
things that they put on a overhead projector and shot them with window light. Some more at portraits. The one on the left was uh, an ad and the the woman painted like George O'Keefe and her husband was a photographer. So I thought, wow, Stieglitz and O'Keefe. So I did a little takeoff on that. The man on the left was uh, a businessman who wanted to show that he worked out of the uh, um, the big courthouse in um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name in Denton, Texas. And he wanted me to shoot him on the steps. I said, well, you can see the building then. So I shot this and I had a flash to the side, which filled him as he went by. A couple more corporate things. This was the, the one on the on the left. Looks like a simple portrait, but um, one of the things I found when you're working with people, and frequently when you're when you're photographing a high level executive like both these guys are, is that you have to deal with the corporate communications guy in the company. And the, the man on the um, on the left is the CEO of Occidental Chemical. And I was photographing him and I had this idea. I thought, wow, what a cool shot it might be for the building. And I mentioned this to the corporate communications guy and he says, oh, he won't want to do that. Because we would, he's on a 15 foot ladder to get up that high behind it. So later I kind of said to, to the CEO, I said, gee, I had this idea very quietly. And he said, wow, he said, I'd love to do that. So we got out there, I have lit him with a focusing grid just on his face from a long distance, very powerful because I knew that this, I had shot this building many times that that, where it has all the signage lights up too much because it's a very bright pink marble. And later in the day, when the sun comes around, you won't be able to see it. So anyway, later when, when the CEO ordered a bunch of the prints for his office, I made sure that the corporate communications guy took them in so it was like it was his idea because you never want to lose, lose your link to the company. <laughs> the one on the right is um, the, a man who's, very wealthy Southern California man, Segerstrom was his name, and what their huge land development there, which made him very wealthy, had been his family lima bean ranch. And they had Ishmael Noguchi, a famous uh, American, Japanese American sculptor, do a uh, sculpture garden there. And what he's leaning against here is the, his homage to the lima bean. And this man had a, a bad hand because he'd been injured in World War II, so I fit him in against it and made him part of it. And again, very, very popular photograph. A lot of things like I do was doing for like the man on the left is for an annual report. And the one on the right is um, <clears throat> a famous, famous golfer. Um, uh, and I'd done a picture of him with some other people. And I said, let me. Um, let me get a picture of you by yourself. And so I did, and, um, and I've never used it anywhere, but I just really like, like that picture of him. Again, parts of an annual report, different cities. I never really did too much advertising because advertising is a, an animal onto itself, but this is a national ad I shot with Tom Landry, the former coach of the Dallas Cowboys. And um, you can see, a print and then look at the final thing that ran full page newspaper. And one of the things that pro things that happens with things that sit around an agency for too long before they run it is people come up with different ideas about things. That football phone there I made the night before the shot because they had told me to buy a phone for the shot. This is out of a New York agency and we'll just use it with him talking on it. Well, the ones you could buy when you lifted it up, half of it went away and you couldn't tell it was a football anymore. So I made that one the night before with a uh, cut that thing out, some modeling clay and stuff. Anyway, it went over pretty well, but somebody in the agency said, oh, I don't, I can't recognize this in football without have, seeing the stripes on it or the, the threads on it. And so I reshot just that part of it and they stripped it in because this was before Photoshop, but it was pretty easy to do. I got into doing annual reports. I don't know if most of you know what an annual report is, but any company that is publicly traded has to put out an annual report every year. And a lot of companies, especially ones that don't do too much advertising, it's their one chance to really show off. And this was the one I got while I was still in New York. And again, my ideas, and they wanted to show power of their equipment. And so I got them to dig for me and 
I got very dirty because I was working right in there with a wide lens to make it look dramatic. And the bottom shot on the right is what it looked like when it was unfolded, but you see what it looks like on the cover. And what you're looking for in these situations is strong graphics. And even the picture of the man on the um, um, roller up there is a very, very strong, strong graphic. Got to, if anybody has a question, don't feel free to jump in, okay? Um, then when I was in, first in Dallas, I hooked up with Halliburton. Many of you know Halliburton. It's a big oil service company. And I worked with them for many years. And these are three annual report covers. Um, one of the things that happens when you get into the high end of corporate photography or any photography is that, especially when they send you out with no idea in mind, they don't want a picture. They want a miracle. And when you're shooting for a company like this, it doesn't really make much. And some of their equipment's not too attractive. You're always looking for an idea of how to make something look more interesting. The one way over on the left was taken off the coast of, of Southern California off of Santa Barbara. And I've got a client with me and I've got a helicopter sitting there at $500 an hour. And my client is having a child because it's a lousy day. And so I said, look, can we get control of the boats, which were owned by Halliburton? I said, get them to come in slightly askew from each other and I'll get a shot. And it was shot in color, but it was basically a black and white shot. But it was very, very powerful showing them and the rig and everything like that, again, with a long lens. And it won a lot of awards. Of course, some people at Halliburton didn't like it because you couldn't see the words Halliburton on it. <laughs> the one in the center was even a bigger deal. I was in um, trying to do it. Almost all these things are shot in the fall when the weather's lousy and or winter. And I was there. I was in Wyoming at minus 40 and I wasn't getting anything. And I said to the guys, I said, is there anything else going on around here? I said, this, I'm not getting what I need here. So they said, well, there's some drilling on the Great Salt Lake. So I got permission to go up there and we waited three days to get out there because the boats that they had are what they call water pumpers where they suck in water and blow it out. And it was so cold, it was even freezing that heavily salted water. Just as we're getting out there, I see this scene in front of me. And I know once the wake gets into the shot, there's no way I'm gonna get this shot. So I am shooting film like crazy to get this shot, which is a perfect reflection. And of course, this was way before Photoshop, so you couldn't have done it. And I, it's a completely unretouched shot. And the one way over on the, the um, um, on the right here was just a rig. And of course, they liked that one better because they could see the boat, but it wasn't nearly the challenge that the other ones were. Here's another one. This is uh, this was an oil, a, a rig that goes out and they sink it into the water to dr a drilling platform. And um, they wanted a dramatic shot. So I shot this at 5 a.m. at minus 25. And I mean, you can barely get out of the car because it'll freeze your shutter and stuff. So I managed to get a, sh a shot there that worked. Another situation, this was in, I was in Jackson Hole, uh, uh, Wyoming, and the weather was terrible. And I, I kept going, I kept, I went back for three days this, and I finally got probably five minutes of good light. And I jammed six rolls through the camera. And this was a wraparound shot of an oil rig in a beautiful location. This is another situation. This was a, um, a utility, an electric utility, and their big deal was they were building a new power plant. Well, how do you make a power plant look like it's an electric power plant? So I'm up at all hours trying to get something that looked decent. And I finally got, this is not a good reproduction, but I finally got this beautiful light coming off these heavy power lines that delivered the electricity. And it made for a pretty spectacular picture. Sometimes you get to shoot things that <laughs> you hadn't planned on, but this was an, an oil. One of my clients had a big well fire. And so they asked me to go up and photograph it. What I, what felt like I should have done afterwards is, is taking pictures of the investors standing around looking at their, their money burning up. <laughs> but what you're always looking for in the field of especially corporate work and stuff like that is something graphic and interesting. And sometimes it's hard to make something out of nothing. And the one on the left here um, 
was a big utility station, which was completely black inside. And so I had these guys put on yellow smocks that they use in bad weather, and I lit it with gels in the back so that it silhouetted it and gave it some interest. But boy, it's, it's deadly to make something out of nothing. So, <laughs> and uh, the other one there was just, I was just offshore. I, I was offshore a lot. Uh, um, and um, I just had one of the got workers walk over and grab one of the heel, wheels and that made for a nice, a nice picture. A lot of work with utilities and you're always again, looking for something graphic. More graphic things, and these are our coal-fired uh, power plants. This one was a, another one where I was <laughs> trying to get a cool picture, and the sun is going down, and it's not turning into anything. I'm way off the road. I'm in a rent car, and you're you're going, and I'm I'm ready to give up because the sun is way over to the left, and I'm not getting anything. I pack up the car and I'm and I'm I get about twenty feet away and the sky turns to that and boy you never saw anybody get back there and get a tripod set up as quickly in your life and this hung in the their corporate headquarters for over over ten years at least <laughs> get lucky once in a while you also once in a while get a, a an interesting subject this was another utility and this is a uh, a so, a solar collector called a Cummins engine engine and um, Again, you're presented with something that's interesting, but you also want to show it well. And the picture way over to the right, I took and I, I put a person in there to give it size and scale. And then I reflected what they are focusing on, which is in the bottom of the picture there. So that, go ahead, I have a question? Okay. Anyway, you're trying to, to, to make things look, look good. And this is the shot they actually used on the cover. And that was the corporate headquarters downtown. I was one of the very first photographers in, um, in Texas, I think probably the very first one to photograph wind turbines because this was the first five wind turbines put out and they're down by Alpine, Texas on, in the right-hand picture. And again, I wanted to do something interesting with them. And the fact is that you can't always do something interesting. So what I really wanted to do is show a little bit of motion. And of course, in broad daylight, you can't get a long shutter speed. So I've got two massive neutral density filters on here to shut this thing down, several stops so that I can shoot at a quarter of a second. And again, I had, I, I used Polaroids a lot. I had backs, Polaroid backs made for my camera so I could test stuff that we didn't have the benefit of being able to look at your pictures like you can now in digital so I could see what I was doing. And that was really the most valuable tool I owned was a Polaroid back made for these. It just made a Polaroid the size of a 35 millimeter, but all of your equipment. So it was really quite a, quite a cool thing. And this is some, some I did later of wind turbines in another part of Texas. I, this is West Texas, just fabulous skies. Did a lot of work on um, for companies that were having things built. This company was having a new new plant built, and so the one in the center was something I just shot, and the two on either side I completely set up. Those were people I grabbed and set them into the shot and stuff like that. And you had to be careful. A couple of these I sold later, but I made sure that you couldn't tell who they were because somebody will sue you otherwise. This was a, uh, a a company that a big construction company in Dallas that had a situation where they had six cranes on one shot on one location, and so they wanted me to do something dramatic with it. So I like this kind of backlit feeling. It made it to feel to me like very much like a a uh, a, a 30s or 40s uh, black and white picture, and I like the scale of the people, the tiny little figures in it. Also did a fair amount of architectural photography, and these are some buildings around Dallas. The one way on the right um, was a company that had buildings close to downtown Dallas, but they weren't in downtown Dallas. So I got on a roof quite right a ways away and with a 500 millimeter lens pulled in their building, which is in the foreground there, into the skyline of Dallas. And they, they really loved that. So. 
again, situations, um, different things I shot. Um, the one on the on the right was a building that was being sold and the, the company wasn't having success in selling it. And I looked at their pictures. They had some beautiful architectural pictures of the building. But the selling thing was the fact that they were right on the stop for the DART uh, rapid transit line. And so I said, let me shoot this building. So I shot it with a 15 millimeter so that you could see the DART train and still see the building. And the building sold in a couple of weeks. And so I always thought they should have given me a percentage of it, but you know how that goes. <laughs> Well, little things, when I would be traveling around, I always see little things that I like, little graphic pieces. This, the one in the, on the left was in Mexico City, the one on the right was in Vienna. Here's a couple favorite portraits I did of uh, the man on the, the left was an artist that I had met and did a lot of work with him. And I own quite a few of his pieces, but he did these beautiful sculptures and he did them on his own with a torch. He didn't send it to a founder or anything. So I had this idea to shoot him at night just with the light from his torch. And so that's what I did. And the man on the, the picture on the right, is, this is the man who actually invented the long handled metal flashlight, which made him fairly wealthy. And so I got a chance to photograph him for a magazine. And so I said, bring as many of your flashlights as you can. So we just turned them all on and then I lit him with one of the flashlights for the picture. So very successful. A lot of work with executives and you run into different situations and things like that. This one in the center here, this man worked with three of his sons. And so I just did a really nice portrait of the three of them. Oops. Um, let me go back that one I missed here. Sometimes you have to set up situations and this was a situation where they wanted to show a, an IPO on the, on the right. And so we completely set up this situation. It looked like it would look. And on the picture on the left was just a graphic illustration for an article on, on business people. I call this um, um, West Texas Cowboys. And this was an assignment I had. And this man was the wing commander for the B-1 bomber when it was brand new. And they had one bomber and it was getting set to take off in 15 minutes. And I kept saying, can we get out there? Can we get out there? <laughs> so I finally raced this guy out there and got a few pictures of him. But, and then the other two are, I took on the same day were a couple of guys with their horses. So again, a lot of executives and um, the one on the right was an interesting one. And this is a thing that happens a lot in Texas with uh, photographing people outside is even as even as this day was a little bit overcast, you can see the sky there. It was an absolutely beautiful day. People cannot keep their eyes open. So I got a great shot of this man in front of this airplane as an illustration. He was a, a lawyer who works in in aircraft sales, and um, he he didn't have he couldn't keep his eyes open, so he's squinting. So by then things are digital. So I. I reshot him in front of a seamless in his office and dropped him in on his original shadow. And it really worked out well. So a lot of things you could do later on that you couldn't do in the old days of film. <laughs> I didn't go digital until 2004 completely. I'd dabbled in it a little bit before then, but I wanted to make sure that it was as good or better than film. But, but I got pretty good at it and I got pretty good at Photoshop. And so it really began to help what I was doing. And um, I had a series of pictures that I did of, of a client in different cities around, especially around Texas and Louisiana. And they wanted to show their company in front of a particular skyline. And this is what I did with the Dallas skyline. This is a very busy road. When that light changes at the end there, this road is filled with cars. And unless you had a lot of money and could shut it down, you'd have to do it some other way. So I shot it like this in the evening. So I knew that I had a strong side light, and then I shot them separately and dropped them in. I dropped in their shadows separately. There are about, I would say there's about, um, one, two, about 10, 10 or 12 layers in here. The thing that's important when you do stuff like that is that you get the lighting in the same direction so it looks real. And later when some of these executives changed, all I had to do was reshoot the executives 
and drop them in on the same situation. I'm pretty sure that that bridge is uh, bridge is now a park. Um, it's I, it's no longer have have public traffic on oh, it. Yeah, yeah. There's that, a new bridge, it, and they kept the old bridge. And, and yeah, and yeah, you're right. And they built the new, park. the new one up a little ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they did that after I left Dallas, but I left Dallas in. Uh, I just uh, thought that was kind of neat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, the the um, further down they where the um what's the little one they have uh they built a, a bridge across it and built a park and the bridge so that was pr pretty neat too um think of the name of it but anyway um i taught part-time uh photog I, I taught um introduction to photoshop and i taught introduction to digital photography at a junior college in dallas called el centro and it's really quite a nice junior college. It takes up an entire city block and so on. But they built a, a new um, campus in West Dallas. And, and I did a certain amount of work for them. And they asked me to photograph it for them. And this is what I saw when I went out there. Okay. Anyway, this is what I did with it. Okay. Now, that is the same picture. All right, what I did is I cleaned it up, got rid of all the bad things over it, changed up the contrast, put in a new sky. The flags were perfect, so I didn't have to do them. I shot all the people separately and dropped them in. I had more than 20 layers in this. It took me about 12 hours to do it, but I used it as a promo piece for my, for my Photoshop class. Needless to say, the client was very happy with it. <laughs> The thing that's interesting to me is I used to be so jealous of illustrators because illustrators could do anything they want. And of course, this looks very much like the illustration that was done for the building before it was built. Well, they didn't have all the bad stuff in there. So what's happened is that we photographers have become like illustrators because of the fact that we can fix things. Here's one that's kind of a funny story. This was a a board of directors of a bank, and um, I had them as a client for a while, and then an art director that I didn't get along with got the account, and I nothing I could do about that, and so he was there on this one last shoot with it, and I had less than 10 minutes to do this shot, and they wanted something candid. Well, candid pictures, you get the back of somebody's head. So I said, we're going to set something up, and I'm going to get them to look up at me. So then the guy is wandering, the art director is wandering, and says, can't you? you know, maybe put some light or something on the back, you know, do something interesting instead of that plain back. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I said, this is the age of digital. I said, I'm leaving it as clean as possible so you can drop in anything you want. And I just left it there. So I'm thinking over the weekend, what can I do with this to get this guy? I know I'm never gonna work with him again. So I had just recently been in Italy. So this is what I did. That's the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And I even had a cut line for it. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> and you see my signature on it? It's my name and Mikel Angelo. <laughs> and I had a cut, my cut line was, we're in touch. <laughs> what I did is I only gave him a print of it. I wouldn't give him the file. I wouldn't let him have any use of it. And of course I never worked for him again, but but at least I got him pretty good. <laughs> I did a lot of work in um, medical situations and, um, you know, you're always trying to make something out of it and uh, uh, sometimes just a good portrait. And like on the left, you're trying to get the, the operator and what's going on at the same time and show that what's going on and get a lot of information in a single picture. These are two interesting situations. One was a magazine picture about a story about the, on the left, this nurse is holding a baby and she's got a thing on her wrist that matches the thing on the baby. This is sadly because people steal babies. So only person that could take it was somebody that had a matching wrist thing. So I scouted this shot before time and I was sure I was gonna have to use a, a doll baby. And I show up and, Boy, this doesn't happen often, but there's this guy is sitting there 
and he sees me setting up and he says, wow, would you like a real baby? And I said, you bet. I said, if you'll sign a release, he said, sure. So uh, his wife was, had just had a baby and was in for complications. And so we got to use a real baby and I used him in the background looking at the, the other babies and it worked out really nicely. So sometimes that helps. <laughs> the one on the right was a situation that was for American Standard, the big plumbing company. And they also own Train, which is based in the big air conditioning company. And they were making a new air filter and um, they wanted me to do a picture of it. And, and the art director's in New York and, you know, they're not coming up with anything. I said, I said, look, I said, give me, I said, have them arrange for me to have a quarter inch thick piece of plexiglass completely new and clean. And, and I brought the rig to hang it up with and had those guys write on it and made it an interesting shot. And this is the first time I did a shot where the art director was completely somewhere else. I put it up on my computer. I showed it to the art director in New York. He commented, oh, I, you know, could you move this, ship that or do this or that? And boy, was that nice. That was the first time I had ever done that with a this was probably a year or two after I'd gone digital and he really was able to, you know, work with it and, and show what, uh, uh, what needed to be done. So always nice to have that available. This is a, um, a vet clinic that was a huge one in Dallas and they, uh, my goodness, they had, I think they had 12 vets there and they even did brain surgery. I mean, boy, gotta love your dog. But again, I set up all these things. I had people bring in their children to use as models because they didn't want to pay for models. And I just, and then they asked me to photograph all the vets. And I said, I said, with or without their pets. And they said, oh, I'll just photograph them without. So I still had them bring all their pets. And I said, look, I showed, I photographed each one with, with one of their pets. And of course, guess which one they love? The ones with their pets. So. Don't be afraid to step in there if you're in a situation like that. Also did a fair amount of children. Somebody said to me, wow, uh, I thought you just did CEOs. I said, well, CEOs are a lot like two to five year old children. I said, they have short attention spans. They, they, they don't want to be there and they want everything their way. So I used them with that one with a little flag there. That was an annual report cover. Um, Again, this was the one on the right was in um, um, the children's ward at um, um, Parkland Hospital. The one on the left was an interesting case. Again, uh, I never did things like a um, catalog, but this um, Barney company asked me to shoot a catalog and, and we shot this. This was the cover and we shot a whole bunch of ideas. And when they got done, I said, OK, let me tell you my idea. And so we did this shot and I purposely cast a, a black girl and a white girl. And anyway, after the shoot, I said, and this of course became the cover. I said to the art director, I said, you should tell the company Barney's company. I said, you should, they should run this as a public service ad and up where that sidewalk is in children's handwriting. It should say good friends come in all colors. Totally wasted. Nobody ever did anything with it, but what a chance. More situations again, like this wasn't, this one wasn't digital, but I had a chance to get something put on, on plastic and move it in close. So it made an interesting shot. Always trying to make something interesting. Music situations. This guy was a composer and musician. I shot for a lot of little magazines. Boy, I'll tell you, there's so many magazines around. It's amazing. Small ads. This is some series I did for Baylor University. Small ads. I even did a fair amount of architectural photography and interiors. Some ads. This is an interesting story. This was one of your favorite magazines, right? Uh, Beverage Industry News. <laughs> I did this shot for the cover of Beverage Industry News. And this was for Dr. Pepper 7-Up. Dr. Pepper 7-Up liked it. And because 
the rights revert to me after the magazine uses it. I was able to sell it to them. And Dr. Pepper 7-Up became their, my major client for eight years. So sometimes doing magazine work pays off. This is for a German magazine. This is a small company that was trying to get into the rocket business in Oklahoma. And uh, it wasn't Elon Musk. It was another one. I don't know how well they're doing, but interesting. This uh, one on the left was shot in Times Square. And I was there with a client. And uh, I had a, a friend with me who had red hair. And I had her out there for this shot in Times Square for the cover of their magazine. And somebody later tried, tried to sue me, saying that, that, that I had taken this picture of her. She must have looked like this at this thing. Fortunately, I had gotten some of my friend turned around so you could see her face. So people are always out there willing to sue you no matter what. <laughs> I was not a sports photographer, but I did the team picture for the Dallas Stars for six or seven years in, uh, in the 90s. And then they won the Stanley Cup in 1999. And um, I did this picture and I stayed for another three hours and did pictures of everybody on that team and their families with this cup. And normally I only charge them for the picture of the team. So I didn't know what to charge them. So I came up with a figure and to them and you can see I, I'm standing beside the cup there too. But um, they quit using me. So that was 20 years ago. You notice they haven't won the Stanley Cup since. They lost their lucky photographer. So <laughs> I did notice that they're in the playoffs again. So hopefully they'll get going. But one of the things I wanted to show you here that might be of more interest to you than my <clears throat> commercial work is <clears throat> every year I have done an original print in black and white. And I started in 1971. So next year it will be 50 years. And I don't know another commercial photographer who has ever done that, who stuck with it for 50 years or even 10 years. Sometimes people do one every now and then or something like that. This is my first year in New York and I moved the tripod because it was so, it was so crazy that first year there. And I would do things where I traveled somewhere. This one's one in Vermont, something kind of scenic and some winter scenes sometimes and so on. This was the view from one of my lofts in, studios in New York and I had this great view of the um, um, Empire State Building and uh, in the fog and that was one of my favorite pictures of it. I was there a couple of years ago and they put a building up so you can't see it from that place I had before. This is my first one in Texas and that's what I call the uh, the uh, cathedrals of the of the or the uh, the the of the oil business. And this is one I made up where I took the horse, the lit up horse and, and shot the ball in, in Dallas with a star filter. Different ones at different times. Here was one that was just a little part of a, a evening scene, fairly abstract one one year. This is the, from the city where I lived in, in Seville. And that's the bell tower next to the cathedral. And I shot that at night on a roll and then I put the roll through the camera again. So this is a double exposure and I found a place where it was really dark during the day. And so I got something with the same architecture. And this is the most interesting picture I've ever seen of this building, which is one of the most photographed buildings in the world. And this is a picture I've never seen of the Eiffel Tower either. These statues, I had to climb up on something to get them, but uh, somehow, uh, Statues of semi-clad women and, and the Eiffel Tower seem to go together to me. <laughs> Here's one I did in Louisiana where I just sandwiched some negatives of the hanging moss. And this is one where I asked people to guess what it was and most people couldn't guess it was frost on a window. This is one I did in 2001 and I took a picture I had done of the World Trade Center and I just put a flower over it and it was kind of in memoriam to the, to the World Trade Center. This was one of my favorites and I, I was staying in, um, in Vienna with my sister who was living there in 2003 and I was hoping it would snow because that's the thing that makes it more interesting in the winter there. And it finally snowed one day and I said to my sister, where should I go? She said, oh, go to the upper Belvedere. There's a lot of wrought iron there, which looks good with snow on it. So I walked there and I 
rush there and I'm running around and I and it's snowing like crazy. And this couple walked underneath this arch and started kissing. Anyway, a serendipitous moment happened a couple days later when I realized that the building behind them is a museum which holds Gustav Klimt's famous painting of the kiss, which is in the right of this picture. So a serendipitous moment. <laughs> this is one I did not To tell you how much people don't, don't look at things, this was taken out of the window of the library in, at El Central College, and I asked five different people in there who I gave the picture to if they knew where it was taken, and none of them did. This is one I did of the, um, I did, this is a composite of two pictures of the state fair. One I did in, in uh, Tokyo, I wanted to show the modern city and I found this location and I just waited. There's no Photoshop here. I just waited until this businessman, businessman and modern architecture are the, the uh, icon of Tokyo. This was one in Rome in uh, 2011. That's the Calatrava Bridge in um, a new thing in Dallas. And that was in 2012. I was photographing and a whole slew of birds came through, which made it kind of interesting. And this is the last one I did before I moved. I moved we moved to um, Georgetown, Texas in 215. And I wanted to do a and a little bit of an homage to Fort Worth. Fort Worth is a wonderful city, but it lives in the in the shadow of uh, Dallas. And um, so I wanted to put together a picture that made me think of Fort Worth. And these are two icons from Fort Worth that I montage together. The background picture is the, the um, Kimball Museum, which is quite a famous museum there. I love the arches designed by Louis Kahn. And the angel is from Bass Hall in downtown Fort Worth and has these big um, angels, these uh, Gabriel angels on it. So I just took pictures and I put them together and I really liked the way the horn fit perfectly into that arch up there. But it made for a nice finish to um, my time in that area. So anyway, that is my life and my uh, world of photography and it was probably boring to you, but uh, it was, uh, it made for a nice, nice lifetime. And uh, I had a good time and uh, enjoyed being a photographer. I don't know how people make a living today, but it's interesting. Anybody have any questions? I do. Okay. This is Clay. Um, I see you, Clay. Okay. I, um, I have a lot of just, I'm just overjoyed that we could have your presentation tonight and see the work that you have. It's an amazing portfolio, um, inspires me as a kind of an amateur photographer um, and makes me think of, uh, since you were teaching students at um, the El Centro Community College, um, what kind of, and I'm, what, what kind of themes or assignments did you find most helpful to them to get into finding their own style or at least a challenging assignment that you used with different classes and you could see it really made a difference the students advanced and the reason i'm kind of asking is because our club uh we pick themes for our competition uh -huh. and it's a challenge to think of themes or, or exercises or assignments, however you want to think of it, uh -huh. that might might challenge us. So, what would you recommend for the club? Or just first of all, just ask uh, asking you about your experience teaching uh, students about photography. Well, um, um, I, I taught two classes. I taught one on um, um, digital photography, and I taught one on Photoshop. And so, each one I didn't really necessarily have assignments for. Photoshop. <laughs> but we would do things in the class and stuff like that. And so um, um, for the um, uh, <clears throat> um, for the um, for the digital photography class, I, I would I would do things like I, I mean, this was pretty much an introduction and, and a lot of these people had just picked up a camera. So you really had a kind of a, a, a broad range in there. But um, I would I would ask them one time to, um, if you if you live in a house or an apartment, I want to see a series of pictures you took in your backyard. 
and I want to see them all different. Okay, and some close up, some pull back, but some that have, you know, maybe some graphic line and design to them or something like that. And some of them, I'll have to say, I did draw on some of them that I had at Art Center. Um, Art Center was a really hard college. I mean, we really, we actually had to do a book called The Industrial Book, where we had to find something being made and follow it through and do a photographic thing. And then we not only had to had to make prints, but we had to make it into a book and have it bound. Mm-hmm. And you had to have it, you had to have as many as six pictures on a single page. And we had to make a mask so you could make each print on a single piece of photo paper. And I want to tell you how many hours we spent in the darkroom doing that. But but another assignment that I did, what I would also do is I would bring in my um, lights at one point and do a um, a portrait lighting demonstration, okay, and show people how to work with lights, and usually with an umbrella and stuff like that, and show how lights draw and stuff like that. And so I would have them um, take a, a picture of someone by window light, one by lamp light, one outside in open light, and one in the shade, so that you had a lot of variations and different different situations to work with and stuff like that. So, um, and and the other thing I would in in a um, in a class that um, um, involved um, uh, Photoshop, I always had them do a layout on an eight and a half by eleven, and um, and that was a real teaching class into how to use layers and stuff like that. But in that case, I would have them bring a bunch of different pictures that would work as a theme, you know, like a party or something like that. So, so that's another thing you can do is bring together pictures that work as a theme and put them together on a single um, um, layout so that you can see, so that people can see wh- when you can, you can take a situation and make it work, work mm-hmm. together. I don't know. Collage, if a collage or just a series of three that has a theme. But exactly. You have- exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or in another good situation, it, when I was in school, of course, we were using film, but at one point, the, the man who taught our portrait class, he made us shoot a single roll of 36 with every single picture different and perfectly exposed. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and there was no way to cheat because he wouldn't even let you mount them. So he had to be able to see all 36 on a roll. So he knew that you weren't cheating and, and <laughs> but did you have things like photo that. journal? Did you did you assign them to do photo journalist or industrial or or annual report as a theme? Since that was part, a big part of your work, I was struck no, by how many of not, your not, not really. Most of the people that were I was taking class that were taking my classes were never intending to be um, 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 working photographers. I'll, I'll, I'll have to say a couple of them. I remember one girl one time. Uh, had showed, showed me a couple of, you know, okay, you know, fairly okay uh, wedding pictures. And I said, wow, I said, do you shoot weddings? She said, well, just on the side. And I said, and she had a, a kind of an entry level Canon camera. And I said, I said how, do you, how do you set your camera? She said, well, I, I put it on that little P right there, program. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, what do you do? Um, what do you have for a backup? Do you have a backup camera? She said, oh, no. I said, oh, I said, well, what happens if something happens to your camera? She says, well, you know, that's happened a couple of times. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, they didn't get any pictures. Uh, <laughs> by the way, the P stands for professional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so anybody else have a question? Yeah, I have one. What's, what's something that you've always wanted to shoot, but just for whatever reason, never got the opportunity? Hmm. Well, I actually always thought I'd like to do some un- underwater photography, but I never, <laughs> I, don't, I don't hold up well it, with, I have bad eardrums and stuff like that. I don't hold up well at depths, but I, I know a couple of people in Dallas who made a living from underwater photography and Brand- randomly, I shoot a lot of underwater photography. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it involves, a, if you're doing it for a living, it involves a lot of travel and yeah. Stuff. And uh, I just, uh, boy, I, I mean, I, I don't know how anybody makes a living today. So, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. 
<laughs> if you ever want to shoot a mermaid, just let me know. We'll hook it up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Josh has got mermaid friends. Yeah, I do. I do. He and, does. And, and for a fin, huh? I I have seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also have five wedding dresses, but I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know what? I, 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 I never was a wedding photographer, but the trouble is when you're a photographer, boy, do you get volunteered for a lot. <laughs> hey, are you bringing your camera? What? What? Yeah. Am I supposed yeah. to? Oh, no. Yeah. yeah they, you, oh, am I, you need a second? For, no, no, no. You're it. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> I've, I've shot, I've shot uh, uh, two or three in the last couple of years here at, at, in afternoon heat and stuff. But, but the thing is that I used to poo-poo weddings, and I have to say... Some of the wedding photography now is is super. I mean, they're and of course it, it it is it does help that they've got the advantage of digital and and Photoshop and stuff like that. But uh, there was a corporate guy I knew in in Dallas who was pretty much my equal. And he got into doing weddings and with he had a grown son who wanted to do it, and they shot a whole bunch. And then he said it was killing us. And so um, what happened is he uh, he looked it over and he said, you know what? He said. We should be shooting fewer and charging more. <laughs> and so they got into, and they became real high-end photographers. And what they really got into was people from India, of which there are a lot oh, of in Dallas. They will pay a lot. Yeah. And he showed me a wedding that cost $3 million. Now, obviously, he as the photographer didn't get that, but it lasted seven days. And they even flew him to India. Same. So, man, I said, wow. <laughs> Ouch. How much yeah. you givers, right? I, I did a I did a three day wedding in Calcutta. It was pretty wild. Is that right? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's pretty wild. Yeah, we've done about sixty Indian weddings. Uh eh, they're yeah. okay. They're yeah. okay. They're long, long days, long hours. Depends yeah, on like yeah. the priest is like, Well, we did one and the like the auspicious time for the ceremony was two AM. So oh, we, we, we had to wait until two AM to shoot the ceremony. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty rough. Yeah. Wow. Any other questions? Well, do you have any theme ideas that we as a club or um, maybe you've seen other clubs use that you could um, share with us? Well, um, for our competition. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I might have to think about it a little bit, but the thing is there, there are a lot of things. I, first, I don't know what you've already done. You know, I, I gave the same talk to the Dallas Camera Club and uh, it was established in 1960. <laughs> Wow. And, uh, boy, do they have an active club. They have over 200 members and, and man, I, I was really impressed. And, and they had all this stuff going on, all these field trips and all this stuff. And I said, wow, I said, that's pretty impressive. And then they would, and they had people that would work with newcomers and stuff like that and help them learn about their cameras. And I said, wow, who needs photo school when you got this? <laughs> but um, there's, there's also themes that you can get into of, uh, um, you know, animals is a good one. I mean, we have tons of deer here. And um, uh, I did a whole thing on deer one time, just just wandering around and so on. Um, well, no more bird pictures. Okay. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Anything but birds. Yeah. I've got a lot of bird photographers. <laughs> yeah. Well, those people are really special. I, yeah, I, <laughs> offer, I offer to give my talk to uh, some of the camera clubs at Sun City. We, we don't live in Sun City. <laughs> But it has more than 10 camera clubs. And they only wanted me if I would talk about how to photograph a, a, a three leaf versus a four leaf clover or something as, as, as minuscule as that. And I said, well, forget it. <laughs> I, my feeling is, do you know what the ASMP is? Have you ever heard of that? Yes. Okay. American Society of Media Photographers. And I was a member of that for years and still am. It's the biggest in the U.S. and and it's mostly professionals. But um, I, I was very involved in the Dallas chapter and I was the guy who got the speakers. And so I always brought in one national or international speaker every year. And, and we, we ponied up the money for them and everything. And uh, uh, usually we didn't pay them, but we pay their way there and stuff like that. And um, and we got some amazing speakers and some of them had nothing to do with, with what I was doing. Some of them were still live shooters. But the thing is, I think you can always learn something. And uh, that's another thing that might be good is some still life stuff. Um, try to shoot uh, Edward Weston's pepper or something like that and uh, so on. So there's a lot of, to me, there's a lot of things you can do that are, are, 
are workable. But like I said, I don't know what you've done before, but you might try something like this last picture I put up here of a, um, I don't know how many people, maybe your people are all purists and they don't want to do combined pictures, but it's kind of nice sometimes to try and put something together. Okay. Um, I just did a 100 page book on a trip I did. My wife and I went to uh, New Zealand, Australia in uh, uh, November and December of last year and for six weeks. And I have, I've only ever done one book before, but I spent several hundred hours putting together this book and it's, uh, it's, it's got 532 pictures in it and it's a hundred pages and it nearly killed me. But, um, but it was a nice thing to do. It gets your pictures together and stuff. And, um, I give talks on my trips at senior university. I don't know if you ever heard of senior university, but it's a big thing here in uh, Georgetown. And, uh, so on, I'm giving a talk on our, that trip next week, but it'll only have maybe 150 slides in it because you can't get anybody to sit long enough to see 532. Of course, in that layouts, I did a lot of them on top of each other and stuff like that. But, but sometimes that might be another idea for a theme is, is a, a, a walk or a trip where you have them um, put it together so it, it works as a, as a unit. So that you have, let's say, um, there's a, a trail in, in a park somewhere or something like that, and you can put it together where maybe one's a lead shot, and you do some of the other pictures over inset on top of it, like a a little layout. And you you maybe could just do it on the computer. You wouldn't even have to print it, but to show it and to make it work as a way of seeing that, and and have it be a different way of seeing that particular location. There's a guy in town here who, uh, unfortunately, I don't think he lives here anymore. A guy named uh, uh, Jack, uh, well, blank on that name, but um, he's a guy who was a very successful professional photographer and got hugely into the stock photography business. And um, um, he got completely out of regular photography and, and does nothing but cell phone stuff. And he teaches cell phone stuff and he shoots everything on cell phone. And he brings back the most incredible pictures you've ever seen on a cell phone. Jack so, Hollingsworth. Yeah. yeah. Jack Hollingsworth. Exactly. Yeah. 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 He, he was, he was probably the biggest stock photographer with the, uh, with Getty images for years and years. And, and he was bringing in millions, but, but he's such a crazy guy. He spent it all too. <laughs> Unfortunately, I never got into the stock business. I sold a few along the years, but I never, I was always afraid of being sued. So I didn't, wouldn't put something up there that I didn't have a release on. So anyway, but, but that's the name you might look up. Go ahead. Well, thank you so much. This was wonderful. And my only complaint was it wasn't long enough. I oh. really. <laughs> hey, can, can you say that well louder so my wife can hear it? <laughs> she, she's tired of going on and on and on and on. <laughs> yeah, I'll repeat it. But um, could you? I, I, I'm sh I'm assuming it was varied, but could you talk about um, your process for preparing for some of those shoots that assigned shoots that you did? Like what? How much research you had to do before? How much time would you get with where you were going to shoot? And I'm sure sometimes it was like nothing to yeah. as much as you wanted. Yeah, it, it, it varied so much. I mean, um, the one I worked with for the long, the, the hardest thing to do with, especially with big corporations, especially an annual report is um, the, the art directors, you're always working through a designer or art director and, um, and it makes you crazy, but they want to use a different person every year to get a different look. And so if you're able to get more than a couple of years out of a, a company for an annual report, you're pretty lucky. And I did, I think I did Halliburton six years and I, I still did peripheral work for them, but you're always looking for a, a client that you can hang in with where, where, you know, somebody that'll pay the rent because the rest of the stuff you get a shoot and then you, you, you don't have another shoot until you you <laughs> dig up a shoot. And so it, it just made you crazy. And, um, I got in with this, there was a, a big utility in Dallas called uh, Central and Southwest, which no longer exists. Somebody bought them. And um, I, the first year I did their annual report, they sent me to each of their 
each of their, they owned uh, four different utilities in, in Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas. And I spent a week at each one. And, and they ran 110 pictures, so it was like a National Geographic kind of thing. And it won best place, first place in photography in the United States for a utility annual out of 150 and companies. And I didn't get any of the awards. The guy in the company got all the awards, but I didn't care because it made me favorite son with them. And so um, at one point I had close to 40, 30, 40 by 60 prints of my work of their service area on their walls and so on. So I did a lot of work, but that's what you're hoping for is something like that. But you can't always prepare. And so a lot of times what you have to prepare, like when I did those wind turbines and I wanted movement in them, I had to go and buy extra neutral density filters and stuff to help me. You're analyzing what you're having to deal with in the situation. But a lot of times, like the one where I shot off Santa Barbara, you, you don't know what's going to happen until you get there. And boy, you just can't, uh, you can't prepare for things. And I, uh, I was shooting an annual in, in uh, Florida once and for a company that made the big cranes, that coring company. And, um, it was a lousy day. And so they sent me back, but I didn't have control of the crane because it was being used for building this site. And I got this beautiful day, but it didn't. So they retouched the original one I did, but it was before the days of Photoshop where you could really fix it up. So it just looked lousy. And so that, uh, I hate to say it, but sometimes I look back at things that I could have saved with Photoshop and it makes me crazy. But, <laughs> but sometimes if I'm going to photograph a personality, especially you want to do some reading and I'll have to tell you one time I really dropped the ball on a guy uh, who was the head of uh, 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 a major corporation and um, and he had some model airplanes in his room there. So I got him holding a model air and I said, I said, are you a pilot? And he said, oh yeah. And so, I, and, and I'm a big aviation person. I'm not a pilot, but I, I really love aviation. And so after the shoot, I find out he was a World War II ace and I said, oh, man, did I drop the ball? <laughs> so <laughs> a better conversation with him. But but the thing that also happened is because, as you can see, I like to talk. I would be in situations where you only got somebody for five minutes and you really would like to have had a conversation with them. <laughs> yeah, I did a lot of work for Forbes magazine, which is um, uh, was owned by Malcolm Forbes, who was kind of a character. And uh, um they got to where they wanted me to photograph the executives while I was, while they were being interviewed. And I hated that because the guy would be sitting there in some slouch position and you can't get a good position, a photograph of somebody. And that was my only chance with them. So a couple of times I'd say, sir, could you sit up a little for me? And, and it would break this guy's train of thought. And so this one guy from Forbes complained about me and, and more than once. And I said, look, I said to Forbes, I said, I said, I said, I'm not going to shoot unless I can shoot separately because I got to have control of the situation or I can't, you know, everybody says, oh, we want a candid shot. Bullshit. You want something <laughs> that looks candid, you know? And yeah. so that, that's what you learn to do is you learn to overcome what you have to work with. And so it just, <laughs> it's crazy. I, I did so much work by helicopters that um, uh, the, uh, there's a place in Louisiana called PHI. Petroleum Helicopters International, and they're in um, uh, Lafayette. And I was once there for a few hours waiting for my <laughs> my own helicopter, and uh, I counted forty five helicopters there, each with its own pad. That's how much business goes on in the Gulf. And, so, and later, I found out that um, Chris Christopherson, the who is you know a famous singer, but he is also a Rhodes Scholar and a graduate of, and was a, a, an army helicopter pilot. And he used to, what, before he, he made it in the music business, he used to go down there and fly the fly helicopters for PHI. So I, half the time I never even got to see the guy I was flying with. So even though I had control of where I wanted to go, you know, out in the Gulf, but uh, I used to tell people, yeah, me and Chris would go out and check a rig out. So <laughs> anyway. But you get to photograph a lot of celebrities too. I one of my favorite stories is um, I at the school where I was teaching. Um, um, they asked me one day if I would teach some 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 high school kids who came to the school to take some classes, and they asked me if I would teach them Photoshop. 
And these kids were way smarter than I was in, in, in digital because they'd grown up with it. Anyway, they were 16 or 17 years old. And so one day in the middle of the time I'm teaching them, I got a shoot with this pretty famous um, um, Dallas Cowboys football player named Emmett Smith. You may have heard of him. He, he also was on uh, Dancing with the Stars, which he won and stuff like that. But anyway, it was, a, it was a cool shoot. It was an all-day shoot where I was shooting stills and somebody else was shooting uh, uh, motion of him. And so in the end, I got my assistant to shoot a Polaroid of me standing with him. And he's not a real big, I'm only five foot six and he's probably five eight, but with all his equipment on, he was bigger. And so I take the Polaroid into the class X and, I, and I'm gonna see if I can make some points with these kids, you know, cause they think I'm Joe Dokes. And, and so uh, I'm passing the Polaroid around the class and, and I know that they all know who Emmett Smith is. And the cast is almost exactly half black and half Hispanic. And finally, I turned to this one girl, Maria, and I said, I said, for God's sakes, I said, where are my points? I said, that's Emmett Smith. And she looks at me and she says, we know you did that in Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to take that as a compliment and just leave it, leave it there. <laughs> I said, that's a Polaroid. And they said, what's a Polaroid? <laughs> <laughs> so you got to know your audience. So anyway. anyway, it was a good life. I, I enjoyed doing the photography. And all I do now pretty much is um, um, take pictures on trips and something. The other day, we had an interesting thing happen in our neighborhood. A neighbor down the street is, is active duty Army. And he and his wife are both medical doctors in the Army. And he was coming back from um, 11 months in Afghanistan, hadn't seen his family. He's got three children under five. And uh, so I heard about it. And uh, so we all lined the streets with flags and stuff like that. And I got out there and I shot it like a photojournalist. And I got to tell you, I, some of the stuff with Life Magazine worthy that I got, you know, the kids running to their father and, and the father crouched and stuff. And and I was pretty pleased with myself that I had done that because I never was a photojournalist and I never worked for, you know, like a newspaper or anything like that. But I got some cool shots and, and I put them up on Facebook, which is the place I put things and stuff like that. So um, do you all have a Facebook page? Yeah. For your group? Um, you should friend me because I put up a lot of interesting stuff on uh, Facebook and uh, it might be interesting to see some of what I put up there, too, because... I try to make it make an effort to put up some nice work instead of just something I happen to get, you know. So, and I've put up some several themes. I a couple of years ago I went to a ranch and did a, a roundup just for myself, and did a whole nice thing and put it all up on, you know, as a as a twenty page or a twenty image thing on uh, Facebook. That might be another thing to make an assignment for. Do an assignment for a Facebook thing with a theme to it, you know, of Whatever, you know, uh, uh, somebody. You, how about Adobe Portfolio? Adobe Portfolio is another way you, photographers can. Yeah, yeah. I belong to, uh, what's the one that you that put, photographers put things on? Um, uh, uh, Instagram. Instagram, yeah. I just, I never have put anything up there. But a lot of friends of mine do that, keep things up there and stuff. And those are also good places to look. And uh, a friend of mine has been watching this. Uh, um, Steve Thomas, he's a, he was a nuclear engineer and, but was a photographer really as a kid had his own darkroom and stuff. So he's gotten way back into it. And my gosh, he's even bought a four by five and he wants me to get mine out. And I said, forget it. <laughs> At Art Center, that's all we could use for the first two years was a four by five. So man, enough of that, but, uh, Les, this is Clay again. Did you describe at any point the kind of um, typical gear that you carried with you or, or your favorite uh, lenses? Uh, well, I guess I didn't. Um, basically, I was a 35 millimeter guy. I could shoot everything. I mean, one thing that Art Center did is, boy, they wanted you to shoot four by five. And man, I could, you know, like a Marine says, I can field strip an, uh, an M1 in my, in my sleep. Well, I could do that with a four by five. But um, I mainly shot 35, but I also owned um, um, two and a quarter and uh, stuff like that. Uh, uh, later in my career, sometimes when I would, somebody asked me to shoot a four by five, I, I would just hire a, a good 
a good assistant from some friend's studio where they shot a lot of four by five and just, you know, give them extra bucks to help me do it because I just hadn't done it often enough. But I, I mainly was a Nikon guy. When, when I moved to Japan, when I was in service, I was a Pentax guy. I had all this Pentax stuff. And I had the very first fully automatic Pentax uh, where the the mirror came back up and the, I forget what it was called, but it was a thread mount and it was slow. And so when I got over there, I traded it in for Nikon gear and, and I've stayed with Nikon ever since. I'm, I'm not one of those people who drift places and stuff. And so I stayed with Nikon and of course went into them with uh, digital and stuff like that. And, uh, um, are you taking awesome. cell phone taking cell phone pictures? Do you have a favorite cell phone? Well, I I just have your basic iPhones, and I I don't even have the latest one with the fancy stuff. I'll have to say lately for travel, I've, the Nikon's are so heavy that I've I've gotten into Lumix, and I use a um, a G nine, which is pretty nice. And on it, I have a um, an Olympus um, twelve to 60? No, it's 12 to 100. So it's, it comes out to being 24 to 200 because you double it. Mm -hmm. And and it's a constant F4. And, and and the trouble is now it's practically as big as my damn Nikon. So, you know, it's like, what, what can you do? So, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I, I don't use them too much. And I, like I said, I grabbed something. I, I got a really cool picture. We had a fog day one day and I looked out the front and, and I... I saw some deer coming by and I got three deer that are almost connected and in the fog with some trees and my gosh, it's the prettiest picture. I've, it may be my annual picture next to this next year. <laughs> with the how do you, stuff. how do you, the annual picture, do you put them on a card and, and make it your Christmas card? Yes, yeah. I do. And what happened was uh, I started off kind of innocently in this thing and, um, um, and I used to have a dark room. When I lived in New York, I had dark rooms and stuff like that. But I don't have a dark room anymore. So when I was in Dallas, when it was still when it was still film, I would rent one for two days. And what happened is I started using the annual card as a promo piece also. So I would send them to clients. And it got to where I was doing 200 of them. And that got to be a real chore. And uh, I also didn't like the fact that they curled up so much. The new papers are better. They lay flat. But the old ones curled up, so I would get, I would fix out just a plain piece of paper and dry mount it to the back of it. But then you had to trim it on all four sides. And when you're doing that with 200 of them, besides the two days in the dark room to print them, it was a, it was a real chore <laughs> to do it. So and now you've got 49 years worth of, of yeah, well, memories. Now, yeah. Course, now what I do is I push print. And somebody got complained because the first couple I did on the computer, I just wrote my name in script. And somebody said, well, I want to see your signature. So I copied that signature. That's the same signature I've pasted on there for the last seven or eight years. <laughs> and so, nobody said anything about it. So yeah. is that image is that image that we see on the screen now? Is that a eight by ten or or you could make it any size, I suppose? Um, you mean the one of Fort Worth? Yeah, the one that yeah, the um, double exposure. I've always done just a five by seven with a four by six in it. Hmm. And I've always done that little black edge. Can you see the little black edge around it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stuff like that. And uh, um, it's not too hard to do. I think I even dropped in the clouds on this one. So, um, but there's some cool things now. There's uh, uh, when I was doing this big photo book on my trip, um, a lot of the pictures didn't have good skies. And so I, I use this thing called, I think it's called Lorimar or something like that. And I just dropped in all the skies, you know, who cares? Mm. You want it to look better. So <laughs> it's not going for publication or anything. So anyway, but, uh, but it's been fun and I've enjoyed doing it. And I may do a few more books and stuff like that. So, and I mainly put up a few Facebook pages and stuff like that. So. Will you put some of the New Zealand pictures on Facebook or have already done? I, I have already done that. If you if you if you friend me and go to my go to my page, you can see all the 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 series I put on there. Great. Some are, some are as many as 20 some pictures. So um, just go to my page and go down to photos and you can just go back through them. And it'll even have the one on there I did of the returning war vet. Which is is pretty cool. So. Um, 
Um, you still carry your camera with you? Well, in my pocket, my cell phone. So uh, yeah, good. <laughs> I, it sounds like I, you're I, still going and growing. Yeah, I, I enjoy it. I, a, a few years ago, I took a workshop with uh, Jay Mizell. Do you know who he is? No. Okay. L look up, write down that name and look him up. Uh, he's, he's a very he's, interesting character. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's still living, but he, I think he's yeah. 90 this year or next. I took a workshop with him at the Santa Fe workshops in uh, Santa Fe. And um, this guy could make a picture out of anything. I mean, you know, a screen and a flower. I mean, just unbelievable. And M-E-I-S-E-L, -E -E I think is the way it's spelled. Somebody there knows who it is, but but have your people look at his his stuff. Um, a photo this guy was so incredible. He he owned his own eight story building in New York City. Wow. And um, when he and and this this is the the investment deal of 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 the century. He he paid one hundred and twenty thousand dollars for it thirty some years ago, and he sold it for sixty five million. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, another photographer who who loved him and his work did a movie on him and his building. And you can I think you can see it on YouTube. So you might look for that too. Um, Jay Mizell's building. So um, he's a real character and you know, he just has you do you know, make pictures out of nothing, you know, a picture of a piece of the street or something, you know, just incredible. So were you influenced by any particular school of photography or um, your favorite? Well, favorite photographer? Uh, probably the, the one I work for is Arnold Newman. I don't know if did any of you happen to look at that video I did on him. Okay. We'll need to follow up. It was it was listed on our, our yeah, homepage. Yeah. Take a look at it. it. It's pretty long, but um, since you're interested in photography, a lot of it's technical, but you you would be interested in it. It's really, really interesting. And Thank you. Uh, he, he, is the, he is the man who, he's considered to be the father of the environmental portrait. Okay. In other words, he says something about the sitter by the situation they're in. Okay, and he hated that because he said, "Well, I just take it, you know, where they're where they are." But so, so many of his pictures are the are the way these people are thought of. I mean, he's so iconic, and um, he, I have to say, he was a son of a bitch to work for. He just <laughs> just drove you crazy. And uh, have you ever heard of a photographer named Greg Heisler? Mm -mm, no. Okay, that's another name you ought to look up. He was Arnold's assistant after I was, and he became a legend. He's got quite a few books out on portraiture and stuff like that. And uh, um, an incredible guy. He only lasted six months with Arnold. I, I stayed with him for two years. So <laughs> tells you what sort of a masochist I am. <laughs> but um, we would go to these places and uh, just... Uh, in, in fact, in the in the in the video is a story of us going to the White House to photograph President Ford. And uh, um, it, it, if you'll bear with me a minute, I'll tell you the story because it's better me telling it than than listening to it on the video. But um, uh, do you do you know how the photographer works in the White House? They follow. Basically, they can go in most places with the president. Exactly. But each each president picks his own photographer. OK, they have a static staff that stay there years on end. OK, but the, the president picks his photographer and it's kind of an honor and so on. And President Ford had a personal photographer. His name was David Hume Kennerly. OK, and he always emphasizes the Hume. David Hume was a philosopher. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, he was a very good shooter, but um, when when Newman got an assignment to photograph President Ford, which he he'd done every president since, starting with um, um, Truman, and so it was a big deal to him to photograph the president. And I had already stopped working with him, and it was a couple of years later, and he asked me if I'd come along as his second assistant. And what are you going to say? You know, no to go to the Oval Office. And so we went there, and it was a January day, and it was very cold, but there was snow on the ground, and the snow off the ground was bouncing into the Oval Office. And David Hume Kennerly was there, and he was our liaison to get in there, Ford's personal photographer. And so he says, Arnold, he says, man, he says, it's two stops brighter than it usually is here. He said, you are so in luck. And we had lights for days. We did not turn on a light. And so, but.
But behind the president's desk is a big window, and they've now built a mound behind it so, so that nobody gets a clear shot at the back of the president from out somewhere. And it's also bulletproof glass, which is about six inches thick. And I don't know if, you, if you've ever seen glass that thick, but it turns green. And so the light coming through the lower part of the window was green. So Arnold said, gee, uh, could we get something to cover that up? So boy, they, they immediately dispatched somebody to get a, um, uh, an army blanket, which we put over the bottom part of the window, but there's still plenty coming in the top. And so he stands forward beside his desk, facing back to the wall. So that he took a picture of Ford with his desk looking the way Ford would be looking if he was sitting at his desk. It was the most unique picture I'd ever seen in the Oval Office. And you could see that it was oval. And it was really very cool. Anyway, it got to where it was taking quite a bit of time. And we had another setup in the cabinet room, which is nearby. We go over there. And Newman was, when I was working with him, was probably in his mid-50s. He was the exact same age as my father, who was born in the same year and the same month. And... Um, he always wore a goatee and the sweat was dripping off his goatee because we're coming up on an hour with the president of the United States in the middle of a day. And I got to tell you, not many people would get that kind of time. <laughs> and but what Newman would do is he would send ahead a book of his pictures, which included a lot of presidents and a lot of kings and a lot of people famous. And of course, they were really anxious to be photographed by him. So. Newman is, like I said, the sweat. And when you're an assistant, what can you do? Hand him another holder? You know, he's shooting both 35 and 4 by 5 And finally, Newman says, I'm sorry, Mr. President, this is taking so long. And before, before the president can say anything, David Hume Kennerly, who's in the background with a little Leica taking pictures of the whole event, says, oh, don't worry about it, Arnold. The president's used to being held up by photographers. And old Ford just spins around to David Hume Kennerly, and he looks at him and he says, yeah, but this is the first time I've ever been held up by a good one. Ooh. That was the magic moment of my <laughs> entire program. Is that cool or what? <laughs> anyway, David Hume Kennerly was on the uh, Sunday morning show a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I thought, gee, I'd like to call in and tell that story. <laughs> but he and Ford were closer than any photographer and president have ever been. They, he'd known him when when, when um, David Hume Kennerly was, live, was with Live Magazine and stuff like that. So and and Kennerly had won a, a Pulitzer for his photography in Vietnam. So he was a, you know he was a well credentialed guy, but but he's a little bit full of himself. So anyway, so anyway, there's a, you know there's a credential presidential <laughs> photographer here in Georgetown. Um, uh, Garcia. Uh, Garcia. Uh, not Garcia. Uh, Gonzalez. David Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Uh, yeah. yeah. David. Yeah. And, and uh, David uh, Hume Kennerly, uh, David Hume Kennerly, isn't he or was teaching at UT? And he, um, no, no, Kennerly lives somewhere else. He doesn't live here now. Now, uh, um, David, uh, I keep thinking that is it? It's not going to. Anyway, um, um, I, I know him quite well, but um, but he's another one who's a little bit full of himself. But he's he's a, he's a good guy. But he gets paid to give his talks, so he doesn't he doesn't give too many free talks out. <laughs> anyway, but um, David Valdez, that's it, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's uh, kind of my story. And anything else? I appreciate you having me there. And like I said, like it's, it's hard to get me to talk, but I'll I'll do it anyway. So. I'll hold up my book that I did on, on uh, um, this is the book I did on New Zealand and Australia. You can see it a little bit, I think, here. And it's, see how big it is? It's, it's incredible. <laughs> it weighs eight pounds. <laughs> and lots of multi-page spreads in it and stuff like that. But, um, you know, anyway, so I'm giving a talk on that next week to the, to the senior university, so. Anyway, but good to talk to everybody. And uh, any further questions? I was just going to ask, what's in your camera bag these days? Well, um, you know what I do is I, I camera bags are not small enough for me. I mean, or the, I have one that I bought at um, Target that um, 
will carry two small camera bodies with lenses in it. And I can't remember what it's called, but it's got, um, it's got that mesh in it so that you can't slit through it. I had a, I had a, I was, I had all my stuff stolen at once in France. And so I'm a little bit antsy and about things. And, um, I just carry, I carry usually two bodies when I, when we travel, I carry, um, the Lumex cameras and I carry a, um, a, a G9 and a, um, what's the other one? It's a, I can't remember, but it's one of their much smaller ones. And, and I carry, um, a, a, uh, 14 to 50 or something. And then I carry the, the one that I use the most is a, is a long zoom. And it's a, it's a, a 24 to 200, which to me is the perfect travel lens. And, and it's a fixed F4. And, and then I carry a longer lens that is a, a 200 to 600. And I got a great shot of a grizzly with that. So it made it worthwhile, but <laughs> no, what else you need those lenses for. So anyway, um, anything else? Just want to say thank you very much. We appreciate your, your sure, coming sure. to join us. Yeah. Um, sometime, if you would like, sometime when we're back to meeting people, I, I, I would be willing to come by and give you a portrait, give your, your group a portrait lighting demonstration. Oh, we'd love that. Nice. Marvelous. Yeah, I, I, I still have lights that are gathering dust and stuff like that. So I would be happy to do that. And, uh, um, and what I do when I do that is I, I let people use their own cameras and then take pictures of other people and show them how the light draws, how, how it works and how Rembrandt lighting works and how things like that and how you can use lights. And, and, and you don't really have to have a, a hugely expensive setup. I have, um, I use, um, um, uh, by, uh, what are they called? Uh, Buff, B-U-F-F, um, what are his lights called? Uh, anyway, inexpensive ones. So uh, I have expensive ones too, but you know, there's a lot of things you can do that don't, don't require a lot of money. So, and, and maybe your people that in your take in your group don't want to do lighting, but it doesn't take too much to learn. And a lot of times I, I almost always flash filled when I was shooting outside because you just can't, you just can't, um, work in this bright sun here. It's just too hard on people's eyes. So I would find a situation and, uh, um, um, just, and, and I have portable units that, that, uh, that are powerful and can, you know, you can still use a light box or an umbrella with them. So, you know, kind of a, uh, a good thing. So, but I've got two lights on me here on either side, I've got a uh, table lamp. So <laughs> give me a, not a little bit of light from either side. <laughs> But, photographers always think about that. Yes, if you if I lean my head over to the side here, you can see these are three of my annual pictures that I have. Um, um, oh yeah, twenty four by twenty four oh. by thirties up on a wall. Backdrop carefully curated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I at first was going to hang them. And I just tried leaning in them up there, and I liked them just leaning there. So, you know, it works out. Works out pretty well. Are you still printing? Are you still printing or have a dark room? No, no, I haven't done that in years, but, um, um, I, I have a couple of digital printers and stuff like that. And, uh, Newman once photographed Andy Warhol when I worked for him and, and, and he was doing him for something else. It was some group. So he got him aside and did a couple of shots. And I thought it was the first time I'd seen him really blow it. And, um, and so I made him some prints and they were actually, uh, not even that great in focus and stuff. And, and so he gets out a, a pair of scissors and starts cutting things out and does pace. And he's selling these things for $25,000. And I said, well, it shows you what I know. <laughs> it became one of, because then it became, each one was really original, you know, because he was cutting it out and pasting it and doing things with it. So, you know, everything's possible in photography, you know, so. <laughs> It's incredible, but I like art. We, we, we've been to art museums all over the world and stuff like that. And, and my wife collects uh, Southwest art and has a beautiful, beautiful collection. And I, 
like more modern things, but good art goes together no matter what. So, you know, and, and I don't even have too many of my pictures hanging here. I have a few, but um, nothing like some people I know have every photograph they ever did on their walls. And, and that to me, that's good in a studio if you're trying to show off to a client or something like that. But, um, you yeah. know, I did a, a close up shot of the top of Big Ben one time we were there and I never realized how ornate the top of Big Ben is in, in London there. And oh my gosh, so I did a big blow up of it and have it on our wall. It's like, wow, who knew, you know, but with a long lens, you can see different things that you didn't see with your regular eyes sometimes. So <laughs> anyway, it's been an interesting life. So how long has your group been going, your club? Four or five years. Yes. Yeah. How many, how many active members do you have? Ed, can you tell me? Huh? Unmute, Dad. Okay. I, I, can't, I can't hear it, everybody, so. We have 70, 75 paid members oh. right now. Okay, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I imagine it's, it's hard to keep members, but, um, and it's hard to please everybody's everybody's wants and needs or whatever so <laughs> well and we really don't know I, I don't think we really know what the effects of the COVID have been i mean it's i, I i'm kind of amazed actually how many people you know do come to meetings and do compete yeah. um, you know because we you know we're we the social aspect you know has is also part of the part oh, of sure. the group yeah yeah and and it's it's you know and it's not quite you know, it's really not the same you know in in the you know in the virtual room yeah so you don't know how many people have have left and are sure. coming back yeah. and you don't know how many are going to come back after we get actually we are able to physically meet again because yeah, yeah. yeah. who knows yeah so we're, we're still kind of waiting on that yeah i'll have to say when i belonged to the asmp in dallas we had meetings uh, once a month and um i i went an awful lot just for the social aspect of it because uh you don't see people that much and and um one of the things that <clears throat> one of the things that happened in in going digital is that um one of the things that i hated was going to the lab all the time and we had four or five labs in town that had professional sides to them where you could code in and stuff that were open 24 hours because you had to get stuff out when you shot film and um, and in the end, I never did um, color processing anymore and stuff. And so I would be there sometimes three or four in the morning and you'd be a whole bunch of guys standing around a big light box. You know, they had light boxes that were six foot by six foot. Some of them were even six foot by 10 foot. And um, people would be standing around there. And what you would do in those days with film is, especially if you shot a whole roll, um, at the same exposure, let's say you were doing a studio shoot and you had it, what you thought was figured out and you shot the whole roll the same way, then you could take, we did what they called a snip test where you, you snipped a piece of it and you processed it to see how it looked for exposure. And we did that all the time. You'd be standing around this light box and, and a guy across the way would say, man, he'd say, look at that. And he says, I can't tell if I need a quarter of a stop or if I need a half a stop. What do you think? And they'd hand it over to you. That was the only time in my life that I ever had photographers share jobs with me because everybody was so paranoid about losing a client. Mm -hmm. So that went on for years. But then when digital came along, guess what happened? <laughs> no more lab. Oops. Yeah. So, so I was, I, I think I was telling somebody there that um, uh, a couple of years ago in Dallas, they had a, a party and they called it E6, which was the last <laughs> processing of Ekachrome. And 500 people showed up, 500 people that hadn't seen each other in all those years. And so, uh, and that was where you missed the camaraderie of it because you, you talked about things and here you are at two or three in the morning and, and, and they had nice facilities for us at these professional labs and that, that, you know, they had lounge area and they had coffee and soft drinks and they never got beer like I wanted, but, you know, and stuff. And so you'd sit down sometimes and you'd talk to another photographer. And you'd have that camaraderie that you never had after that. You know, maybe now with Zoom, everybody will Zoom with each other and that'll be, be it. 